who I know will bring us wonderful words of encouragement, words of life. So I give to you the phenomenon, Reverend John Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vance. Uh, Good morning, friends. Joy to add my own words of welcome. Um, to you all on this wonderful Sunday morning here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica. And to also greet those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. You know, this past week on May 28th, a phenomenal woman, the American poet, author, and civil rights activist Maya Angelou, having fulfilled her life's purpose, made her transition. Dr. Angelou, for your information, was named Spiritual Hero of the Year for 2014 in the January edition of Our Science of Mind magazine. And we actually tried to get her to come to our Spiritual Living Conference this past February to accept the reward. This, however, was not possible. Dr. Angelou, read and studied voraciously, mastering several languages, including French, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, and the West African dialect Fanti. Angelou authored more than 30 fiction and nonfiction books and has left humanity a legacy of literary brilliance undergirded by love, compassion, and a deep caring for the human condition. One of my favorite Angelou quotes is, and I quote, I am convinced of this, she says. Good done anywhere is good done everywhere. For a change, then, she says, start by speaking to people rather than walking by them like there are stones that don't matter, unquote. Sounds like an assignment, eh? Yes. <laughs> no, that's not your assignment this week. Although you may like to honor Maya Angelou's memory by making a point of saying something pleasant to at least two strangers every day this week. I know that this weekend at Calabash, the international literary festival taking place here in Jamaica uh, at South Beach in the parish of St. Elizabeth, I know that many strangers will be strangers no more as they share their love of words and music together. And many of our Temple of Light family are there sharing the Temple of Light light, um, both, literary, both in, in the literary sense and in the sense of camaraderie and the love and the warmth that we, we know we generate at this center. I'm sure then that they will honor her and later in today's service, our own Lilith Nelson, herself a, a poet of some note, will share one of Angelou's poems with us in our, during our musical item. <laughs> I'm smiling because another phenomenal woman who profoundly influenced my own journey used to say to me, come, sit here, son, beside me and tell me how you're shaping up. I, of course, refer to my late mom, Daisy, who wouldn't hesitate to knock you into shape if she thought your behavior merited it. So I've titled my encouragement this morning, Shaping Your Life. In our outreach work at the General Penitentiary here in Kingston, Reverend Michael Record and I encourage participants in each 12-week class to see if they can identify their life purpose. It's not an easy task. And yet you would be amazed at some of the life purpose statements some of these men make. I once read an article in Science of Mind magazine by author W. Bradford Swift, in which he takes the view that a life purpose isn't what you do. It is rather the context, or if you prefer, the vessel into which you pour your life which then shapes your life and all that you do in each moment. Swift describes your life purpose as a cup into which you pour the water known as your life. And he notes that the water is composed 
of three basic parts. First, there is you, a conscious, living person, capable of choice. Second, there is time, since all our lives exist in moments of time. And thirdly, there is action, what you are doing in those moments of time. Now, friends, there is a close relationship between what you do and your life purpose, just like there is a close relationship between a cup and the water in it. Yet, they are both distinctly different. The subtle difference can be critical in determining how satisfying and fulfilling our lives can be. It also makes a big difference in assisting us to gain clarity concerning our own life's purpose, our reason for being. I found practitioner Steve Golding's presentation last Sunday most thought-provoking. And if you weren't here, I'd like you to, to go online to our YouTube site, um, www.youtube uh, stroke temple of light or on our website and listen to that talk and it was pr thought provoking for me because he gave us an imaginary look at the lives of several people who had been touched by the phenomenal Jesus it set me to thinking what did happen to the little boy after his generosity fed so many people and you know, it's interesting, some skeptics say that what really happened that day was that a caravan with a load of food broke down nearby, and rather than allow the cargo to spoil, they shared their food with the multitude gathered to hear Jesus. Others posit that the little boy's selflessness so embarrassed everyone else in the crowd that they reached into their garments and pulled out their two buller and cheese or their two Johnny Cakes and shared them. But my friends, whatever really happened, it was a miracle. It was a miracle of spiritual community. It was a miracle of what happens when people get together and share, isn't it? And did Lazarus, like so many modern day uh, accounts by people who have had an out of body experience, did he, was he one of those who said, I never again fear death? You know, when people have out of body experiences or near death um, experiences, they say, I've lost the fear of passing over. Is that what happened to him? And Mary, the two Marys, um, they must have been profoundly influenced too, by the way, Shoah. So friends, for me, Steve's message was a call for me to look at how my own encounter with the master is shaping my life and my life's purposes. Is the vessel into which I am pouring myself worthy of the master's command that we love one another? Is the mold which is shaping my life one of judgment or one of compassion, one of love, or one affair. The Catholic mystic, uh, Father Anthony de Mello, gives this illustration, quote, you listen, said the master, not to discover, but to find something that confirms your own thoughts. You argue not to find the truth, but to vindicate your own thinking. And then he told the story of a king who passing through a small town saw indications of amazing markmanship. Trees and barns and fences had circles painted on them with a bullet hole in the exact center. This marksman had made a, bull a bullseye every single time. And so his majesty asked to see the phenomenal marksman and the chap was brought trembling into the royal presence. I had to meet you, said his royal highness. This is incredible, he said in wonder. How in the world do you do it? Oh, your majesty, easy as pie was the answer. I shoot first and draw the circles after. <laughs> Isn't that like so many of us? We form our conclusions first and then build our premises around them later, don't we? 
looking for justification for what we think is correct. And so we listen to messages or attend classes or go about our daily lives with a mental set that's set in concrete. And we look for justification for our own prejudices, our own judgments, our own little selves, instead of opening up ourselves to allow the truth to widen us and open us up and make us better people. As we see at the end of Jamaican and Nancy's stories, Jack Mandora may not choose none, which means I do not take sides in this issue. I simply give you the story as I got it. But the truth is, friend, God gives us the power to choose in every moment the thoughts, the words, the deeds that will shape our own lives. There's a wonderful story in John's Gospel about an encounter between a woman of Samaria and Jesus that undoubtedly reshaped her life. It is in John chapter 4, verses 7 to 14. Let me read it for you. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith to her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is very deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Unquote. Of course, then as now, when we speak metaphysics, the woman at the well misunderstood the master teacher and interpreted literally what he had said. So she asked him for the special water that would save her the arduous task of coming to the well every day. But then Jesus knew that she, like all of us, could dip deeply into the well of her own being and find within herself new meaning in her life. And so friends, I ask you to join me in also knowing this for the participants in our correctional ministry at the Tower Street Prison, that those persons participating will dip deeply into the well of their own lives and find there the beauty and the truth of their divinity. And as for yourself, if, like the woman of Samaria, you thirst for a deeper understanding of your own divine nature, or if, like the marksman in the Anthony de Mello story, you are drawing circles around the holes of your mistakes and your prejudices and fooling yourself that you're on target, you may want to consider dipping into the well of your being this morning. For being is one of the most important components of your life purpose. That is why we chose being as our theme for 2014. It's at the top of page one of your program, of your order of service. Let's say it together. I focus on more being in 2014. Seen? Let's say it together. I focus on more being in 2014. Seen? In the well of being, your choices, my friends, become clearer. There within, you know that rather than choosing fair, a sense of lack and limitation, or the pre-programmed belief that life is one long struggle for survival, you can opt for universal, unconditional, grace-filled love. Let's say that. Today I choose universal, unconditional, grace-filled love. 
Today I choose universal, unconditional, grace-filled love. Put your hand on your heart and say it and just feel the, the energy there. Today I choose universal, unconditional, grace-filled love. So if you think of Swift's analogy of the cup and the water, the real question isn't about the composition of the water of your life, for listen to me. The stream of your life originates in the fountainhead of all good. It is already good. The gift has already been given. That is pure water. The question rather then is about the composition of the cup that you are pouring that water into, the cup of your life's purpose. And that cup of purpose has three components, and I wanted just to share them with you. First, it's your vision of what you see as possible for your life. What do you see as possible for your life? And lots of people say to me, I don't know what my purpose is. Think about it today. What is the vision that you hold of the possibilities for your life? Second are your core values. And you know, friends, these intangibles of life that really matter to you, your core values, help you to gravitate towards others who share similar values. And that's why, as a spiritual community, I really think we share something special. Now, having shared values doesn't mean that we're always going to agree with each other or like what we do. But having shared values means that we can listen with an open heart and when we disagree, have what we call a loving confrontation. Rather than when things don't go according to your paradigm of how it is, you walk away. And you know what I found, friends? When there's somebody right here in this community who gets on my last nerve and who I'd rather not see or deal with, I know it's not about them. You know who it's about? I have to look at myself. It means that there is something in me that needs to be healed. And therefore, it's a wake-up call to do something about me. The third component of our life purpose is who we are at the very core of our soul, of our being. This is our essence, the part of us that we know is inviolable and that we can count on, and indeed that our family, our friends, our church members, our neighbors, our whole community, the whole world can count on as well. The cohesive factor, or if you prefer the glue, the cement, that holds the three co components of the cup, vision, core values, and being together, that cement is love, that which the master bid us have for one another. The love is the universal force that binds us together with cords of everlasting unity. It is a force that mixed with the three other components, vision, core values, and being, shapes our lives. And so this brings me to your assignment for this week. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is to do some purpose pondering. And listen up, I want to tell you how we're going to go about this. All this week, periodically pause during your day and ask yourself this question. In this moment, is my life being shaped by love or by fear? In this moment, is my life being shaped by love or by fear? Ask yourself that question when somebody bad drives you on the road. Ask yourself that question before you go into an important meeting, the decisions in which are going to, be, to make a world of difference in people's lives. Ask yourself that question about the way you handle your employees, your family, or the way you speak to your children, the way you deal with your neighbors. Ask yourself, in this moment, right now, in this moment, is my life being shaped by love or by fear? And those are the only two motives. If you're not coming from a place of love, you're coming from a place of fear. 
If your answer is love, then breathe a simple, love is now shaping my life. I'm on purpose. Let's affirm that together. Love is now shaping my life. I'm on purpose. Now you have to be honest with yourself. If the answer is fair, ask yourself, but what if I were to shift and allow my life to be shaped by God's unconditional love? How would my thoughts, feelings, words, and actions change? And then affirm the same thing. Love is now shaping my life. I'm on purpose. Give it to me. Love is now shaping my life. I am on purpose. Dr. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this teaching known as science of mind, writes in the textbook of the same name that each of us has within us a deeper nature. Let me quote for you from page 559 of that book. He writes, this deeper nature being an eternal unity with God or with the living spirit is more than man. It is where the being of man or the nature of man merges into the being of God. So as we dip deeply into our divine natures, let us realize that entering the secret presence of this tabernacle of God, we will, like the pilgrims of old, have to shed what does not belong to the kingdom of good. We have to deliberately drop that which would hurt, for we cannot enter the gate of good with a sword in our hands." Unquote. Let us affirm together, I allow myself to dip deeply into my divine nature. Together, I allow myself to dip deeply into my divine nature. And so my friends, I know for each of you, a greater sense of purpose and today, I want you to dip deeply into that divine nature and know that God's universal, unconditional love is indeed shaping your life in this very moment. So turn to your neighbor and say, God's universal, unconditional love is shaping your life. Namaste. God's universal, unconditional love is shaping your life. Namaste. I know that as you share the chalice of your life purpose with others this week and beyond, you are a blessing to all whom you encounter, and that you and they and the people in your life, like the woman at the well, will thirst no more for truth. Namaste.